Side order has gone live, and I've already broken myself free from the grasp of the members and garnered some chlorinated souvenirs. Funny as it would be to lean into the monochrome and finally realize that there is no anarchy within these walls, I can blatantly see that now. I don't know if it's the fact that I've realized with Enter the Gungeon that roguelikes are my addiction and I lean into it heavy with my builds, or the fact that I have so many of them under my belt that I've just become accustomed to them gaining them at some point, but this is the first time I've been able to get out on top of a trend while it's still live and it's weird. I was supposed to turn the lore of order into like a series for my YouTube streams to be cut down in future for a video. Video. But within release, I got this, found out TFA Shadow released the new characters the same release day, got to see my actual preferred idol group and catch up with them, found out I would be fighting alongside them in this DLC, met one of the artists I actually idolized, retrained some of my names, beat the drill breaker, discovered something kind of scary, made a video about the runs, and then I beat the DLC. So I'm kind of confused because I'm still able to do the Lore of Order series even though I already let me organize this a sec. So I'd really fallen off with Splatoon because I'd played mostly during fests and events where there's tons of players online all at once. Like real talk, this DLC was the first time I played in 2024 and the sole reason I didn't dust off the game in September for the two year anniversary. I was used to teams with compositions from the deepest parts of Tartarus that Cerberus would actively let you help him keep in there. American, European, and Japanese McDonald's Wi-Fi views so purposefully slipshod in design you'd swear that one of the wonders of the world is how the matches didn't get turned into a creepypasta, as well as the many totally Twitch TOS safe things that people will draw and spread around in this game advertised as E10, that I, as a person who hates authority and watches edgy adult films, totally wouldn't react to in a negative way at all. Seriously, scary as this video topic is to me, the things that y'all put into this plot are far more scary. Point is, I hadn't touched the game in too fast and was kind of on a cleanse from all that stuff for a bit. Side Order was hyped up as this massive DLC that's going to carry Splatty 3 into 2025, so I was waiting rather patiently for the full package to come out. When they released the hugs from the last two games, I kind of just shrugged at it and moved on back to writing that horror game script I never finished but tried to turn into a fan dub for a bit. When it finally released, I decided, eh, I got an absurd amount of Nintendium, let's get it. I waited so long to get this one TBH that I forgot it was a thing, so I didn't have super high expectations other than if it makes me want to play the game again. Spoiler alert, it did. So I felt kind of at home within the spire of order. Relax, that's not what I mean. Team Anarchy for life. Procedurally generating my combat encounters and already being equipped with my main kind of left me to ponder the more important questions of this DLC. Not to sound like a Marina simp, but one of the first questions I asked after being the tutorial was, Hey Marina, this is all pretty sick. Like, this is fresh as AF and all. Why did you make this? I already knew from Octo Expansion that Marina was a level 10 technomancer capable of universal level creation if she saw fit, so the why kind of took major precedence over the how, especially since Marina can casually be seen flying across her keyboard, hacking, programming, and composing with one fucking hand. Hearing that in her off time, she created a world of procedural generation and an entity who somehow sees order in procedural generation. Yeah, that's just Pro's girlfriend. Doing Pearl's girlfriend things, how it, exactly this is meant to awaken the free wills of sanitized inklings is still beyond me right now. I know it works, otherwise Deadfish wouldn't be able to speak to us and she'd probably just be wondering where her equipment is, literally trying to DJ scratch the very air and wondering why there's no vinyl under her fingers. This is actually a pretty important lore point to receive before I continued on in my exploration of the Spire, and then on stream, I said something about how it's odd we haven't run into any kind of boss that can shoot back at me for real instead of one just sniping me from a distance, raining ink at random, dropping a bomb, and then hitting a drift straight out of initial D, or just saying fuck it and swimming up to me to try and take a chunk out of my hip. Effectively, my salmon run brain was in overdrive, and I was taking note of that since it felt like a missed opportunity. Hi. There are many things in Splatoon that don't scare me. The fact that nobody questions why big men use sanitized ink colors, meh, got over that. Realizing that we're the bad guys when it came to Salmon Run and that no matter how Paragon you were while working, the story mode in Splatty 3 is your karmic consequence for manifesting your destiny all over little buddies' ex-family members and friends. 
<laughs> we kind of had that coming for a bit now. The fact that at the end of the game, Lil Judd is effectively taken over GrizzCon, become more fuzzy, and probably is looking into how to make fuzziness monetizable. Honestly, he's been searching for a one-off on Judd since he was cloned, so good for him. The concept of parallel canon, however, absolutely terrifies me. Parallel Cannon is one of the four random bosses you can bump into while climbing the spire. It takes the form of Inklings or Octolin, depending on how you chose to lock in Splatty 2. Should you have saved data from Splatty 2, these things will psychomantis your tentacle style to their heads and keep that style for every encounter. I find it scary that even though I didn't want the DLC for the old school of tentacle styles, that a boss can remind me that I used to rock the Skrillex cut back in the day. It makes me wonder what exactly Agent 4 is doing now that I've gone full age, because apparently it's just in their nature to have their genetics used in nearly every possible I found you faker joke in existence. Because according to the lore of these things, Agent 4 was part of the template for them, meaning that in my version of the game, these things are both squid and octo, with a disgusting amount of battle testing. I'm not saying that I'm godly at Splatty. I I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm really not. However, I do know that I've spent so much time failing at everything. It's one thing that had tons of data on solutions to problems. Though, imagine if you didn't have all the solutions, but tons of data on how to avoid failure. Now with the prior knowledge we have, reporter force connecting an ungodly number of stuff wasn't into this place. The fact that this place is meant to help repair the will of the sanitized octos so that they can have free will and fun, and the idea of a boss that is literally an army of several copies of you, the player, you see how this crap scares the crap out of me? Should I also add in the fact that if it wasn't for the fact that we literally have the game's soundtrack as a deus ex machina so strong that it has its own freaking lore, it's canon that we fail. In the game's ending, when we be order, he flat out admits that he was Batmaning us the entire time. He stalls for time so that the grayscaling can go global, and it does. And when we go through that crap, our heart fucking stops. Like, like it stops beating. This is one of the only bosses where you not only get hints on how to beat them actively, they're the only boss whose data basically amounts to, hey, you remember that online turf war thing? We got stupid good at bot programming. They're you, but faster, more relentless, more bloodthirsty, and with little care for the weapon in their hand as long as it puts you under jet black ink. They even react, which just makes interacting with them all the more creepy because they use distorted inkling and octoling noises. They say ow when they die, and hearing the teammate's super jump sound when I know I'm not online, and that this DLC is single player, it, it sends a special chill through me that mixes with existential confusion. Now the idea of an army of you only being able to be taken down by you dialing in and turning them from ink to sweat is already scary enough. The fact that they all come with a support drone that can summon gelatins for extra support adds to that fear even more. As it implies, that was one of the few things Porter copied into these things from the Spire, not us. The fact that they play like my friends going straight up goblin mode after a full team wipe is neither here nor there, but does make me scared to approach. But do you know what the more terrifying aspect of this crackpot ass theory is? These fuckers actually stack with you. You reconfigure the pallet, their copy of that weapon now hits harder. Just got a new weapon, they now have two more variants of it. Oh, you came in with more ink resistance and speed? Get ready to spend your tank playing keep away with a Luna, or dancing the dually tango now that you turned your normal splat doolies into dapples, or the distance dually dance if you went for a squelcher build. And you see that your dually copy just happens to be one of the spawn-ins with triple splashdown. Fighting this boss all the times I run into it, not ran, won, actively won, like you don't stop seeing them. I couldn't help but think about the many times me and my friends joked about how there's going to be even more cephalism species to worry about when side order drops. Now I can't help but think that all the people saying that we're going to get fuzzy inklings as customization might have felt a subtle shut the fuck up, he said, when they saw this boss. It kind of feels like a subtle way for the devs to go, yes, yes, we heard you on the fuzzy inklings, sharklings, and healings, mantling ideas. Really, we did. There's a chef here. While these guys don't operate in the way that one would think they do in-game, I just want you to remember the grayscaling, which, while being straight up mind control, with the idea of parallel canon, and the fact that we did die for a good couple minutes, it turns into more of 
gene editing or something that may be a little bit more familiar from the last game. If you happen to play Octo Expansion and remember the Metro and happen to have a certain golden hair clip, the Memverse was an immediate callback to Mem Cakes, which gets confirmed when you read the Dead Diaries. Marina might feel bad about that though, because Paul reads them out loud with her standing like five feet away. This space is conjured up from all the memories and experiences in the men kits of every Octoling. A stockpile that Tartar dumps to the wayside. I doubt that Tartar would be above trying to do something like this for bad reasons, let alone boys. And both would see fallen Cephalizens probably as a small casualty. Sure, Grizz wanted to make all the Cephalizens embrace the fluke and return to Mammal, but I could at least see him butting heads with Tartar and DJ Octavio because they aren't looking for what he is. Octavio wanted recognition for Octos and Inkling's destruction, but Tartar wanted to test, then train, then literally grind up battle-hardened Octos into a super gene pool. Order to skip the testing part and said nobody's special, everyone gets it memorized, no exceptions. These guys are basically the bad ending of Splatty 2, but if Tart decided not to make a cannon and instead simulated the Octarians to near uber squid levels and make a leech. Thanks for watching what... whatever this is. I may joke about how this boss is like the Lovecraftian abomination of the Splatoon world, but it's kind of cool to have some of these enemy types they put in the game as customizations. Like, share, comment your theories about Parallel Cannon and other gelatin ideas you may have. Until whenever I post next, I can't help but imagine how things could have gone in the Parallel Cannon. Order can make these things stack with us and give them the sole purpose of stopping our run. If Order is basically trying to turn us all into those things, what would Chaos have done if we didn't reject modernity and embrace energy?